Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Staunton campus and uh, those watching on our iCampus also. I uh, want to welcome everyone. Open your Bibles with me to James chapter 2. Um, we'll start in James. We'll go to Matthew in a couple seconds. Before we do, uh, last week we began a brand new deal. Uh, we'll do this every month. Um, I should back up. Every Sunday we'll do this, and every month there'll be a different um, ministry that we partner with. But this month there's a ministry called Souls for Souls. And, um, and what, what happens is, is that for every 10 check-ins, a child in some different... Well, they could be in America for that matter. But uh, one of 130 different countries will receive a free pair of shoes for every 10 check-ins. Uh, I think on the screen at both campuses, um, well, that's not the one, but there. So at the Carnival campus, this was last Sunday, our check-ins provided 23 pairs of shoes. And there's another number, whatever that number is, for the Staunton campus. And, um, and then that's grown over the week. I think now it's like, I think it's one of the 40s right now. Uh, that just your check-in. So during the week, people have checked in like on Tuesday or Thursday. Uh, some of you have been faithful to do that. You can do it twice a day. You can do it every 12 hours, basically. Not twice a day as in 15 minutes, but every 12 hours you can check in. Um, you can check in. You don't have to be at the campus. Uh, this morning, I checked in to Carville campus, and I checked in to Staunton campus. So I'm 30 miles or 25 miles, whatever it is, from the Staunton campus, but I checked in there. So you can, you can be anywhere you want to be, and you can just type in Cross Church dash Carlinville or Cross Church dash Staunton, and then those two campuses will come up. Okay, so it's not new building. So in the Carville campus, if you see where it says Car- Cross Church new building, that's the wrong one. Okay, it's Cross Church dash Carlinville here, Cross Church dash Staunton in the Staunton campus. Um, the ministry we're partnering with, what, what happens, we're, we're, we're partnering with a, with a ministry who actually partners with ministries, right? So every month, like last month, it would have been Compassion International. Last month, they give out um, 28 or 30,000, I don't want to say 29 and change, but I get my numbers mixed up sometimes. I, 20, I think 29,000 and change uh, free meal or full days of meals for uh, people who needed food. Okay, so that was that would have been in, in May. June is the partnership is is souls for souls, and then there'll be another one in July. So I will encourage you to take your phone out, to go to Facebook, to check in, and take a picture, whatever you want to do with that, and do that. So that will help. Um, that will help us provide some shoes. Helps us partner with our partners. All right. Um, today, what we're talking about this entire summer is this. this it's like a series of of standalone messages, okay? And uh, the series is entitled One Simple Truth. Today's One Simple Truth is hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. I don't know, <clears throat> I mean, I'm gonna say, um, <clears throat> I started saying that, uh, I don't know, back in the late 80s probably. And um, it helped me a great deal to understand people that the people that um, routinely hurt people, it's because they're hurting themselves. And, um, and when I can put that in perspective, um, and sometimes the people they hurt the most are themselves. All right, so I'm gonna talk about this from a different perspective today. I don't see how, see how it comes up. I'm gonna jump from where we were last week. Last week we were in James. I'm gonna jump from James. I'm gonna read some faces there. I'm gonna jump from there into Matthew. So uh, let me just read the scriptures and then we'll come back to the outline. Um, so last week we were in Matthew, or excuse me, James chapter 2, and um, what I was really talking about last week um, would have been in verse, um, I have completely lost my mind. You ever do that? Have you ever lost your mind? Um, anyway, the, 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 point, the point from... Actually, I was in Acts, or James chapter 1 last week, wasn't I? Okay, that makes a lot more sense to me. I'm thinking, I didn't teach on that last week. Um, last week, what we were really talking about was that transformation is a product of taking, it's the follow-through of taking a lot of small steps, okay? It's not, if you remember, it wasn't the one big step. It's that the one moment with God, that thing where God stirs you, where you make that one decision, whatever that thing is for you. And then you take, you take follow-through steps, next, what we call next steps, 
And then after you take some of the next steps, there's going to be another moment or another stirring from God or whatever it is. And then, you know, that's how you experience lifelong transformation. Most of us don't experience lifelong transformation. Now, this principle is not just a spiritual principle. It applies to every area in your life. So whether you're getting out of debt or you're losing weight or, you know, you're making some kind of spiritual decision or it's about your relationships or it's about your education or your future and your job. I don't care what we're talking about. In every area, this, that principle applies. Well, before that verse we used last week um, and after it, it talks about the tongue. Okay, so that's what I want to pick up with. Um, verse 19, James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce righteousness that God deserves. And I actually talked about, because the, the two verses later, it's like, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself, but do what it says. And that was the point of last week's message about transformation was, don't just listen. We have all kinds of listeners all across America. There are lots of people sitting in chairs or pews in churches listening, but they're not doing what the word says. They're not doing what God is speaking into them. They're not, the, the seed that's being sown is not growing in them, et cetera, et cetera. So we, that, that was last week's message. But it seems weird it comes right after this, you know, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger stuff, right? Well, on the, end, on the other end of it, jump with me to chapter, chapter 3, James chapter 3. On the other end of that, that stuff, it says, uh, well, actually in the end of chapter 1, it actually, you know, the closing of last week was, that, you know, chapter 1, verse 26 uh, those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a uh, tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves. And we talked about how, you know, it actually says that their religion is worthless. And it's attaching how we communicate with our relationship with Christ. That's what it's attaching us to, okay? Um, anyway, chapter 3, uh, he continues. This is verse 3, James chapter 3, verse 3. When we put bits in the mouths of horses... It makes them obey us so we can turn the whole animal. Now, if you've not been around a horse, um, if you're sitting on a horse, you have things in your hand called reins, right? And those are usually leather straps that come to the front of the horse's mouth, and there'll be a piece of metal called a bit that goes in the horse's mouth, okay? So just picture, if you've never seen that, that's what that is. And so basically, a small person can control a very large, powerful animal because of the bit that it's in its mouth. Okay, that's, that's the illustration he's given here. Um, verse 4, or take ships, for example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider the great forest set on fire by a small f- spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring, a salt spring produce fresh water. All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. All right, so in that, in that passage, he uses the illustrations, okay? I mean, you know, it, it, and Jesus did it, just as James doing the writing here, but Jesus did it himself. He would use parables or illustrations so people understand things. So he says, you know, here's you got the, you got a horse, you got a bridle. You got a ship, you got a rudder, okay? And you got a, you got a large forest that is burnt down. There's, you, know, you picture those huge forest fires that are hundreds of acres or thousands of acres, but they were always started with a single spark, it was a single thing that started that huge monstrous fire. And he's saying the tongue is just like that. And we all know how easy that is to say things we wish we hadn't said. Now, again, come back a little bit from last week's message. In our culture, it's not just what we say. It's what we tweet. It's what we text. It's what we put on Facebook. It's the speed of our thumbs sometimes. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, 
Number one in the outline, our words, attitudes, and actions are fruit from the tree of our lives. Our words, attitudes, and actions are fruit from the tree of our lives. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Make a good tree, and its fruit will be good. Make a bad tree, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? How do you recognize an apple tree? You know, it's got apples on it, right? If it's got bananas on it, you don't go, hey, that's an apple tree. You recognize a tree by its fruit. Now, let me tie that back to the passage in James. How he closed that passage in chapter three of James was that with our same mouth, our same lips, we praise God, and then we curse people who are made in God's image. And he says it shouldn't be that way. And then he says, can salt water and fresh water come from the same spring? But we know that logically that's not true. He's saying the same way that salt water and, and, and fresh water can't come from the same spring, we shouldn't be inconsistent in what we speak. That we shouldn't praise with one with our same mouth that curses someone else. Now, here's the problem. Um, we have culturalized or Americanized the scripture. Christianity, whatever. And we've made it okay to do anything we want to do and because God forgives us and we're okay. And yes, God forgives us and we get to go to heaven and all of our sins were hung on a cross and all that kind of stuff. That's all true. <clears throat> but what we've done is we have lowered the bar of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And what has happened is, is that people get confused now. There are countless people who call themselves Christians who may or may not be saved, I don't know, but whose lifestyle, whose fruit does not evidence that they know Christ their Savior at all. There are people who come to church every Sunday. They could be pastors or leaders in the church or you know, paid staff or you know, really you know, significant volunteers in the church. And that doesn't mean that their heart's right. doesn't mean their mind's right. doesn't mean that they're following Christ. I mean, they're, they're, it doesn't mean they're surrendering and trusting God and they're walking in obedience. Matter of fact, the vast majority of church leadership in America is in disobedience. I mean, that sounds harsh to say, and my friends will be upset with me for saying it, but it's the reality. I mean, if, 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 if God is not present in your activities of your church, if people aren't being saved and baptized, I can go through this whole list of stuff, right? If your, con your church has a bunch of conflict, and I'm just go on and on and on and on, the problem is the lack of the Spirit of God, not too much of it. If, if the early church was known as Christians, how were they known as Christians? Do you remember what they, how were they known by? They were known by love, right? So when you have a church that hates each other, when this side hates that side over there and vice versa? What is that? When it's okay to have conflict or it's okay to, we don't worry if we don't baptize. Baptisms are going down. I mean, like eight of the last 10 years, the baptisms nationwide have decreased. Is that okay? Well, yeah, it's okay. We had a good church service and we had some candles. We passed the candlelight thing around and it was really, it was all, I just, it was awesome. And we sang my favorite song. And I had a look up tears. It was awesome. If your life isn't being changed, then the church you attend has a problem. Or you have a problem. Remember, if we go back several messages now, I guess it'll be in April, May. One of the points was, was that if we're not experiencing lifelong transformation, then it's either for one of two reasons. It's either neglect or it's the lack of salvation. 
That's the only two reasons that you wouldn't experience lifelong transformation. Right now, no matter how good you think you are, if you're not experiencing transformation, it may be small steps, you know, because sometimes it's just small steps. You just take small steps. That's all you're doing. They don't look big, but you put a bunch of small steps together and you're way down the road, right? If you're not experiencing the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life leading you into lifelong transformation, there's only two reasons that would be true. It's either because you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and the Spirit of God does not indwell and live inside of you, you're not saved, or he's there, you just neglect it. That's the only two options you got. Nowhere in Scripture can you decide, you find a place where it's okay just to get to a spot and just be good from here on out. Just because I come to church on Sunday morning, I'm not good. Just because I volunteer, I'm not good. Just because I, whatever the topic is, I'm not good. That is not how the Bible works. All right. So the point is, is that if we are to be judged by the fruit of the tree of our lives, what would we be? Now, I don't know how this is going to play out because I can go multiple different directions. I could turn this into one's whole series and things like that. But let's talk about hurting people for a second and how they hurt people. And I'm talking about them as opposed to us because sometimes us is them. Does that make sense to you? All right. And you may be sitting next to them right now, right? And, um, and sometimes you are them. But here's the deal. I wrote down a couple things just so I wouldn't... I don't want to spend too much time on kind of control myself, however, but people who walk around hurting, hurting people hurt people, they usually have some kind of inner anger and they just transfer to whatever they're transferring to, okay? I mean, they're just angry, okay? And uh, so when they walk into the room, they bring that with them. There's no reason to be angry. They may or may not look angry. Sometimes they just look angry. Sometimes they look normal, but as soon as something happens, they're angry, right? They, they, it's the same level of anger. Here's the best way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it into a positive sense in some way. If you got the, the seventh grade girl or boy who's in love, right? They had a boyfriend or girlfriend now for like 12 hours, and they are freaking out of their mind, okay? And they're going to get married, right? Right? And then... You know, a couple weeks later, they break up with that boy or girl, right? Because now they hate each other because they're horrible, right? Then there's a tendency to transfer those emotions to the next person. Well, let's just change it. Let's just say it's the, it's the person who's had a boyfriend or girlfriend for two or three years. And that relationship was built and earned over time. That relationship ends. And then the next person walks in our, their life there's a tendency to transfer all those emotions immediately right there. This is what they're used to. So you can transfer positive things. I'll say love, okay? And in that case, sometimes love isn't really the right word for love, you know what I mean? But you can transfer emotions that are positive and you can transfer emotions that are negative. So sometimes, let's just say I'm an angry person, I'm carrying anger with me, and there's a blow up because what happens is you didn't deserve my anger, but you're the one who pushed the button. And so I've had, you know, I got like all this anger here and maybe it, it came from somewhere else back over here and it's been built up for years. But when you push the button, you get the whole load because, and you're like, what did I just do? I didn't do anything. Well, it's because they're transferring anger. All right. A person who's hurting, usually, usually they, how they see things, okay, they see things through... Um, a prism of their own pain, like glasses of their own pain. So everything they do is colors. Like if I'm wearing blue sunglasses, okay, like blue lenses, I can see something and everything I see has a blue tint to it. Now, if you don't have the blue sunglasses on, that's not how you see the world. You're thinking it looks like this. And I'm thinking, no, it looks this way. Because I'm Looking through everything I see, I'm seeing through that prism or that, those glasses that I'm wearing that, that I'm looking through my pain or my woundedness or where the word is, right? So every conversation, every action, I filter through my pain. That's what that would look like. So you say something to me or you don't say anything to me. 
I'm filtering that through my pain, through my woundedness, through my hurt, through my insecurity. What are the phrases you want to use? Usually for somebody who walks around hurting, they usually see themselves as a victim. Um... Matter of fact, they'll even attack, they'll even be aggressive, they'll be angry, they'll do something to hurt you, and they'll alienate people around them. And then when they alienate people around them, so then therefore no one wants to be around them, then they get upset with the person who's not around them. It's like, well, nobody's here for me. You know, why don't you, why, you know, because in their mind, they don't understand, I did this thing, I hurt this person or these people, I did, I was aggressive and I was nasty this many times in a row, no wonder they did whatever. They don't see it that way. They see it as, I'm going to hurt you, and I'm going to be mad that you're not back over here to help me out. And then you come over to help them out again, and they hurt you again. They always see themselves as a victim. And it's kind of a, men- the, the victim mentality, is a, it's a mindset, it's the way you think, but it's a different, I'll, I'll chase a different path if I don't care. Um, kind of being self-absorbed kind of goes with that. A person who is, uh, hurting many times or self-absorbing. What that means is, is that it's about them and their pain. Like they're so caught up in their emotions or their feelings or their thoughts and they're obviously right. They're not really worried about anyone else around them. All right. Now, let me just back up for a second. And some of those, I gave you kind of some, some extreme kind of parameters, let's just say. But here's the reality, biblically speaking, that we are to be recognized by our fruit by our words, our attitudes, and our actions. And a person who is hurting and who is mean to other people, um, they can be saved. They very well may be saved. Being saved does not mean your hurt goes away. Okay? Knowing Christ your Savior does not mean those things are resolved because those things still need to be resolved. Now, God can, but that's not usually how it works out. There's, that's a root system conversation, whatever we have. All right. So let's just talk about us for a second. So let's just say that our words, our, our attitudes, our, our actions, this is why we're being judged by the fruit of our tree. Let's just say that sometimes we look wonderful. We're preaching a great message from the stage or we're singing great songs or we're having a nice life group message or we're teaching our kids the right things or whatever it is, we're just wonderful people. And maybe it's because we're in control or maybe it's because we're performing or maybe it's because that's our heart and whatever, that's fine. But let's just say there's other times that that's not who we are, that's not consistent with us. That other times we are angry or we are hurtful that our attitudes are not right attitudes or the words we speak are not right words to speak or the behaviors we choose are not right behaviors to choose. What do we do then? Now, I may get to this later. I don't know if I'll get to it or not. The phrase, just pray harder, is not the right answer. Just come to church more is not the right answer. Those are not right answers. See, these are real issues that need to be resolved. And what we have to come to, what we, this is really the high process that this is the issue. Do, does a person, do I, do you, do we really believe that Jesus, the Lordship of Christ, his spirit indwelling us, whatever phrase, ever how you want to term that terminology, that do we really believe that it's meant to make a difference in our lives? That it's meant to transform us? If we believe that, then we have to stop making excuses for the things that aren't the way they should be. We have to take responsibility. Let's go back to, from last week's message because it's kind of an ongoing theme with us. If the event happens, if the moment happens, and I choose not to walk out the next steps of that moment, that decision, that process, whatever that thing is, I choose not to walk out the next steps. What ends up happening is, instead of having another moment that keeps me moving forward and being transformed in my life or my relationship or my finances or my health or my weight or my whatever the case is, right? 
we'll, we'll, we'll stay right here. Well, we keep repeating the same cycle over and 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 for decades in many cases. Well, why is that? Is it because God can't or we won't? Is it because God can't do the work of transformation in us or is it because we won't fall through with the next step we're supposed to take and then stand firm? And take the next step we're supposed to take and then stand firm. Then take the next step we're supposed to take and then stand firm. And sometimes the next step is stop saying stupid stuff. Sometimes the next step is to recognize that just because you can say it or just because you can text it or just because you can put it on Facebook or Twitter does not make it okay. That everything you do, you represent Jesus Christ. That you represent your family, you represent your church. And at the end of the day, someone's looking at me or they're looking at you, and what they're saying is, is that what kind of fruit's on their tree? Well, I see their words, and I see their actions, and I see their attitudes. I want nothing to do with that. Or I see their words, and I see their actions, and I see their attitudes. And I wish it could be that way. Many times when we're hurting, we don't recognize we're hurting. We don't see that as we're, we're the hurting person. It goes back to what I was talking about, the glasses, okay? Everybody is hurting me. Okay, I learned this, you know, decades ago now, ready? And this is not earth shattering to some of you. It may be for somebody, but not usually. Okay, if you have a problem with Bob, and you have a problem with Bill, and you have a problem with Susie, and you have a problem with Jane, you might be the problem. Okay? Now, none of us want to be told we're the problem. Nobody. Not a person. Nobody wants to be in their family and say, you know, our family would run really smoothly, except you're the problem. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear our office would run really smoothly, but you're the, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear in their friendship circle, we have a great time until you show up at the party. Nobody wants to hear that. But here's what you have to own. I mean, if you want transformation, here's what you have to own. Is there a place where you're the one who's hurting? That what you bring to the table is pain. And that you're great until somebody tr- flips the button or pushes the button or flips the trigger. That, that you're great until that one thing happens. As long as you're in control, because this is how this, okay. I'm getting information out of my head because things I want to say that I don't have time for. Anyway, I'm fast forwarding. <clears throat> okay, so there are common tendencies that we have. And maybe one of those is if I'm not in control, then I get, my woundedness gets stirred up. As long as I'm in control, we're good. So when I'm not in control, maybe I get loud. Maybe I get angry. Maybe I get quiet and pout. Maybe I wander off of myself. Maybe I sabotage something or create some big chaos, you know, you know to get control of the situation, right? Maybe I just internalize it all. Maybe I got enough control that I don't ever externalize it. I, I never communicate to people out there. But maybe just right in here, it gets really dark. That I go dark. That I go hide myself away someplace. That my thoughts are dark. We can sabotage our families. We can sabotage our churches. We can sabotage ourselves. We're definitely sabotaging the work of God in us. So if your words, how we're going to judge you is that, your words, your behaviors, your attitudes, how do you match up? See, we can also, let's reverse it all. We can also walk into a room and always be the bearer of hope, always bring solutions, Just as I can walk into a room and be negative every time, I can walk into a room and be positive every time. What 
what's the one thing that negative people hate? They hate positive people. Hate optimism. They not hate the person, okay? But if you're negative and it's horrible and poor, woe is me, the last thing you want to hear is hope. The, the last thing you want to hear is the eternal optimist saying, it's okay, we can get past this, right? Now let's reverse it. <clears throat> the person who's the eternal optimist, the last thing they want to hear is something negative. Is that right? That's kind of salt water and fresh water, isn't it? Now, eternal optimism is not a spiritual gift. It can be just as fake and just as wrong as negativity. Just because you can be positive doesn't mean, because sometimes it's like, hey, this is a train wreck. We need to fix it. You know what I'm saying? We don't need a fresh coat of paint. We need to tear down the wall and rebuild a wall. Now, the point making is this. But if you know Christ your Savior, the Spirit of God indwells you. So whether it's a negative situation or it's a positive situation, the Spirit of God indwells you. He is not an emotional being who wavers back and forth with our emotions. He's going to speak faith, hope, trust, words like that. He'll speak things that are real. If you have a problem, the Holy Spirit's never going to say, yep, that's a problem. The Holy Spirit always is going to provide solutions. I mean, I can show it to you in the Bible. I don't have time, but I'm just telling you, that's the way he operates. Well, some people, all you can see is problems. This is a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, and that's a problem, and that's a problem. Well, if, if you just listen, the Holy Spirit inside of you is going to give you solutions to problems. Some people are really good at pointing out problems. You ready? When the, God gives you eyes to see problems, sometimes he's going to give you a heart to be the one who engages and fixes the problem. Anybody can ride by on a galloping horse and say, yep, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem, and just keep walking. Anybody can do that. What if, I know this is crazy, what if the local church, not just, you know, an organization, what if the individuals of a local church stopped, stopped pointing out problems, started to be the ones who found and brought solutions to the table, and started to be the ones who found money and brought money to the table, and brought elbow grease to the table, and brought heart to the table, and brought passion to the table, what if the local church stopped being an organization and started being the church? Read your Bible and see how the church functioned. See how the church existed in the, you know, the book of Acts and following. See how they, the, the early church, see how they interacted with one another. They didn't sit around pouring out problems. Number two in the outline. Our words come from the overflow of our heart. Our words come from the overflow of our heart. Verse 34. Uh, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? This is, he's talking to the Pharisees, religious leaders. Um, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The way I memorized that decades ago was that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That when you uh, fill my glass up, the what comes out is what's in me. And what's in me is going to go through the filter system of my pain. And so you push the buttons, or you attack, or you say something dumb, or you hurt me in some way from my perspective, or life is just really frustrating, or I'm just really tired or I'm just really hungry, or I'm just, well, you know, whatever, the, you know, we have our things we go through. What comes out? This is true, that out of the overflow of the heart to mouth speaks, but I'm gonna go add another layer to it. What I say is only what I give myself permission to say. That make sense to you? 
what I text or what I tweet or what I put on Facebook or whatever the phrase is. It's only what I give myself permission to do. I have no control over my thoughts at the very first moment. I have no control over my emotions at the very first moment. Like, I'm just here, everything's okay, and then whoosh, there's a thought. You know, I'm just here, everything's okay, whoosh, there's an emotion. Something happens. I feel good, I feel pain. Uh, there it was. But I have the next layer, I have choices, I have control. I can choose. And so I am so whatever, I want to respond such and such. I got choices. No, <laughs> that is not how I respond. I have the ability, and everyone else does too. Everyone has the ability to not say the dumb thing, to not lash out in anger. The problem is, is some of us give ourselves permission to. We give ourselves permission to pout. We give ourselves permission to lock ourselves in a room. We give ourselves permission to walk out of a situation. We give ourselves permission to complain to everybody we see. We give ourselves permission to gossip about what we're going to gossip about. We give ourselves permission to tear someone down. See, those are all the signs of a hurting person. Ready? I'm trying to keep this contained without going too far all the different places I can go with this. Let's just say that a person gossips because they enjoy hearing gossip and they enjoy passing gossip on. Okay. That's not okay. It's not healthy. There's something wrong inside or you wouldn't do it. Not anybody I know likes to be gossiped about. Gossips don't want people gossiping about them. Does that make sense to everybody? Then why would they gossip about someone else? People who tear people down or talk behind their back or those kind of phrases, they don't want anyone to do that to them. Then why would they do that to others? See, it's just a sign of the pain. You see what I'm saying? It's a sign of the hurt that we carry with us. The unresolved issues that they overflow out of, out of what's in our heart. And the, the biblical concept of heart is not the thing that beats in your chest. It's the seat of your emotions, S-E-A-T, the seat, the center of who you are. That out of your personhood, that you're going to speak, you're going to communicate, that who you really are is coming out of the personhood of who you are. Now, your spouse, people in your family like that are usually the people who can push your buttons the fastest because they know exactly where to push, right? They know the sore spot. I get it. I understand. But someone has to be the adult in the room and stop, right? Just because your spouse or your parent or your child or your friend can push the button and get the response out of you they want, Listen, I can't, I can't control anybody but me. I can't, you can't control anybody but you. And so that person, they can say what they want to say. They can push the button they want to push. They can flip the switch. They can do whatever they want to do. You're the one who gets to choose. What fruit are you going to grow on the tree of your life? Are you going to put all your faith and trust in that other situation's ability or your own woundedness' ability to control and manage you? Or are you going to come back and say, you know what? I have a Savior who's greater than all my sin, who's greater than all my pain, who's greater than all my woundedness. And I don't like any of those things. I have thoughts and I have emotions. But I also have a Savior and I want to choose to surrender to him. And I'm not going to say things that's going to embarrass him. Everybody's perfect. We're all going to fail. But that's what we call personal responsibility. That's why we got this thing called, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I said that. It was wrong. I'm so sorry I did that. It was wrong. I'm so sorry I've been whatever I've been doing. So don't think about this being perfect. But it's about taking one more step. And maybe if you have a tendency to say things you shouldn't say at home, maybe the next step is just stop. Just stop. Here's something else I found out because I'm old. <clears throat> you know that those fights have never fixed anything in the history of mankind.
Think about that. Knock down, drag out, holler, scream, whatever you want to do, right? At the end of the day, it all goes away, just to be repeated here shortly. Number three in the outline. Our pain is not an excuse to stay in our woundedness. Our pain is not an excuse to stay in our woundedness. Verse 35. A good man brings good things out of the good stored in him. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in him. Now, I know we don't like that terminology. He's not saying, well, what about the rest of us? No, you're either good or you're evil. That's how he's saying it. You're either a follower of Christ or you're not. I mean, either you're growing a tree that produces fruit that's in keeping with the nature and the character of God, or you're growing a tree that doesn't produce fruit that's in keeping with the nature. I mean, that's just how the Bible says it. But I tell you that everyone, you'll hate this verse. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So if you think there's no accountability for that rant, there will be accountability for that rant. For by the words, by your words, you'll be acquitted, and by your words, you'll be condemned. What it's saying is we will be judged by our fruit. We say we are a follower of Christ. We say we love Jesus. The difference in a person who goes to church and a person who loves Jesus, or the difference in a person who got baptized or prayed prayers or volunteers or gives money, and a person who actually is a follower of Christ and has the Spirit of God living in them is the fruit that they produce on their tree. That's the difference. When the Bible says that you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it doesn't mean that you may not be saved. What it means is that if you are saved, these things ought to be true. Pay attention. If they're not true, there's a problem. Maybe there's weeds, maybe there's some sin, maybe there's some distraction you need to get out and clear out of the way. But these things ought to be true about you. Not just at church. But in your home, in your job, in the community, in the people you interact with, in the places you go, some of us need to deal with pain, wounding us from our past. Just pray about it more, it hasn't been working, I know. Just read your Bible more, it's not gonna work, I know. There's a root issue that needs to be resolved. Many times, we look at our emotional maturity, not always, but many times, if you look at someone and say, well, they're acting like a 12-year-old, it's because at 12, they had an emotional trauma that took place, and that's where they are emotionally. They're they're damaged, they're paralyzed emotionally at that place. I mean, you you can pay attention, you see 45-year-old men who act like, like 10 years old. I'm just telling you, if you talk to them, there was some trauma that happened at 10. I'm just telling you. That's just, that's pretty common. Some of us need to own, I'm gonna use that phrase going back a few weeks ago, the root, the issue, the, the weed that keeps growing. We need to recognize, I keep hurting people around me. I'm the one who keeps causing disruption. I'm the one who says things and has to apologize for them, or I'm the one who pouts, or I'm the one who manipulates. Because a lot of times, and I know this is so hard because if you're, if you're the hurting person, you don't want to own up that you're hurting and maybe you're even mad at me. That's not uncommon. People get mad when I talk about these topics because, you know, they think I'm talking to them, but that's just the way it works. Some of us need to own up and just say, I mean, just pay attention. You know, I mean, you're not, you know. You, you know what you say when you send text messages? You know the last time you tore somebody down and, called them what you called them and said what you said and put them in their place and walked your way feeling like you're the big person on campus? You know, you know when you did that? I'm sorry for your pain. I'm sorry for the wounds you're carrying with you that that stuff grows out of. God wants to heal you. He wants to restore you and it's not a prayer, it's a process. It's a journey of you responding to the stirring of God and then taking the next step he asks you to take. 
That's it. It may revolve you going to some kind of recovery group like our Living Free or something else. It may go to you talking to someone, taking some personal responsibility for some stuff. I don't know. It may come to you just making some self-discipline choices like this is never okay. I'm never going to say that again. I'm never going, I don't, like you've heard me say it this way. Every time a person loses their temper, it's always a, a defense mechanism that comes out of insecurity. Always. Now, if you're the one losing your temper, you think it's deserved. They deserve me to lose my temper. But if I have to raise my voice, if I have to get angry, if I have to let my blood pressure go up, it's because for some reason I'm feeling vulnerable, I'm feeling insecure, I'm feeling somehow under attack or whatever it is, and I'm addressing the situation. Many times that is because there's a woundedness in me that needs to be resolved. There's a thing that God wants to heal in me. I don't have to walk around angry. So-and-so did such and such. Yes, they did. You ready? If they make me angry, they have control over me. Right? If they can stir me up by making sentences or doing things in public or sending some kind of message, if they can make me angry, I'm giving them control. Do you see that? If I'm giving them control, Jesus is not in control. Again, I can't help it that something hurts me. Somebody says, Tim, you're whatever. Okay, oh, that hurt. Okay, I can't help that. But I have complete control of what I do next. My pain is what makes me want to lash out. My pain is what makes me want to communicate and explain to someone how horrible of a person they are or whatever the thing is. But if God heals us, we don't have to respond that way. We can speak truth in love, not in anger. We can know when not to say anything because the things we're getting ready to say, just rah, 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 rah. It doesn't mean a hill of beans. It doesn't change a thing. Some of us are the people who've been hurt and we're hurt in an ongoing way. There are people around us who just, they hurt us. We believe in them. And every time we believe in them, they bite us. We forgive them. We try. in a short, condensed way of saying this. Some of us need to figure out we're not victims. We can be victimized. Like you can hurt me, okay? Just back up, you have to think this through for a while because I obviously don't have time to keep talking about it. You can hurt me. You can say something, do something that hurts me. How I think turns me into a victim or not. If I think and feel like a victim, my woundedness, my pain, I want to lash out. I'm hurt. Oh, they have done something bad to me. I am such a... You know, that's how we think because we're victims. If you don't think like a victim, then what does it matter? Just because someone else shows their butt doesn't mean that I have to respond to it. <laughs> right? Just because someone else can't control their emotions, just because someone else lashes out in their woundedness and their pain, just because someone else is on a self-destructive path, just because someone else just keeps whatever the thing is, they, on the same cycle of whatever it is, I don't have to react to that. I can be victimized. 
but I have never been a victim. I don't think like a victim. I choose. Now, in my way of thinking, I'm a follower of Christ. It's not me being tough. Jesus was victimized. Are you tracking? He was lied about. He was killed as an innocent man. I can go through, you know, Jesus was victimized. Was he a victim? <laughs> no, he was not a victim. He was a savior. He was a redeemer. He was a healer and a restorer. He was infilled with the power of God to accomplish the work of God. He was being victimized his entire, min- well, the last part of his entire ministry, but he never saw himself as a victim. The spirit of God who lives in you will never allow you to see yourself as a victim. Your mind will see you as a victim. Your emotions may see you as a victim. We hate being victimized. We hate being hurt. We hate being lied about. We hate the crazy neighbor or the crazy family member, the relative who does whatever they do on Christmas Day or whatever it is. We hate all that stuff. But it's how we think. If you've been thinking like a victim and you've been allowing the people around you who hurt you, then you remember repentance definition is change your mind, change your direction, your purpose. Maybe the area you need to repent from is how you think. I have no control over that person. I have no control over that situation. I have no control over whatever's going over there. I got complete control of me. I choose that the Spirit of God control me, not my emotions, not my whatever, and not someone else's words or actions. I choose, as an act of my will, to want to grow a tree that produces fruit, that the words, that the attitudes, and the behaviors that come out of my tree evidence that I am a born-again follower of a living God who has transformed me in the past, who has transformed me in my present, and who will transform me for the rest of my life. That every single thing that the enemy wanted to use to destroy me or you, that God's going to use to make us the men and the women he called us to be from the very beginning. That I may need to take some responsibility for my failures. And I may need to say some heartfelt, I am so sorry. And I, need, need to make, I may need to self-discipline myself in multiple different ways. But at the end of the day, Jesus wins. And my woundedness is not an excuse for me to be controlled by my pain. For me to not be the man that God called me to be. Freedom is not the event of this morning. If God's stirring your heart today, whether you're the herder or you're the hurt E or you're both, or you're the one carrying long-term woundedness with you, or you're the one who's being hurt on a regular basis by someone else, that is not gonna happen in a moment. But in this moment, God may stir your heart and give you inspiration to take the next step. So at the end of the day, the question's really this. What's your next step? What do you do next? What do you stop doing? Let's pray. Hey, Father, there's a room this size, the number of people who are stunting and watching on our iCampus. God, there's a Undoubtedly, some of us who cause pain. And there's undoubtedly many of us who receive pain. My guess is, Father, there's many of us who don't, we try not to cause any pain, but we carry a lot of woundedness with us, and sometimes it leaks out. God, I pray that the day is a day of eyes being opened. that we can acknowledge the root of the hurt or we can make a choice to to seek you to give us an answer to that hurt. God, I don't want to be us to be a church that's just full of good listeners. 
God, I want us to be a church of doers. God, I want us to be a church of not just people who are hope and restoration to the people outside our church. God, I want this place to be a place of hope and restoration for all of us. And God, some of us need hope today. And some of us need to be restored today. Some of us need to be forgiven today. And some of us need to be the ones who forgive today. God, some of us need to cry because there's a lot of pain behind that fake mask we're wearing. Some of us may need to come to the altar and just lay some things down to you. Some of us may need to respond in whatever ways they are, but God, I pray today is the day of next steps. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.